Hi all, uh, my name is Alan Weller and I publish the book Abhi Dharma in Daily Life under the imprint of Zolag. The book is authored by Nina Van Gorkum. On the next slide there's a quote from Goodreads reviewing this book and I would like to explain why the book is so important and um, some tips as to how to study it. Uh, the video follows on from another video on YouTube called Why Abhi Dharma and that's well worth listening to and, I, and I've transcribed some of the points onto this video. After six years I have quite some Buddhist jargon but this is going too far. It's all very interesting and wise but totally inaccessible. I could not get through. Goodreads access July 2016. Um, I think most of us who've studied the Abhidharma uh, have been in this very same situation uh, especially when we've just come across it. It's, it is a difficult book uh, and therefore I'm responding to this um, review by just giving you some advice and also why we should study and kind of how much we should study if you like. So I'm going to address the following questions in this video. Why did I publish it? What is the Abhidharma? Why study the Abhidharma? Why use Pali terms? How does the book ADL Abhidharma in Daily Life help us with the Abhidharma? How can we study Abhidharma? Is Abhidharma a part of the original scriptures? Why publish? My background is in physics. I graduated with a physics degree and I worked as a senior physics lecturer at a university for several years. In around about 1978, I was given a free version of Abhidharma in daily life by a friend. Within the first six or so pages of this book, I began to realise the potential for understanding the world in a different way. So what I mean by this is, is the understanding that we have uh, in our daily life from university, from the television, from the media, from films, all of that understanding is intellectual understanding, but actually there's another way of understanding. And that's what I got in the first six or so pages of this book. And this came from a beginning of understanding this difference between concept and reality. So what I want to try and do in this video, video is to give you the same opportunity uh, to try and get you, to try and help you to understand how the Abhidharma works to understand the world. So you could say it's like a parallel universe. Um, there are these two worlds parallel to each other and the purpose of the Abhidharma is to spot this other world. And if you've ever seen the film The Matrix, it's a, a good analogy uh, for what's happening. Uh, we live in this artificially constructed reality and the Abhidharma is kind of pulling the plug on that artificial constructed reality. Um, so really, Buddhism is kind of labelled religion, but actually it's a type of physics because physics means knowledge of nature from the Greek. So it's another way of knowing the world. But also, it's a very beneficial way of understanding the world. And you'll see, the more you understand, the more you'll see the benefit of this type of understanding. What is Abhidharma? Seeing is Abhidharma. Hearing is Abhidharma. Sound is Abhidharma. Tastes are Abhidharma. Um, touching is Abhidharma. Heat is Abhidharma. So in the Abhidharma, we use words uh, to point out realities. But the realities of our life are not words. So the whole purpose of the Abhidharma is not to just read and like the terms, if you like, or to be immersed in the books. The purpose of this book, of Abhidharma in Daily Life, is to begin to understand realities of our life. Um, and before mindfulness, this thing which we call mindfulness, before we can even start it, we have to know what the object of mindfulness is. Um, and in order to do that, we have to intellectually know the difference between concept and reality. So Abhidharma translates as higher reality, or sometimes um, it can mean subtle reality. Reality is subtle and it's difficult to understand. So seeing... There's seeing now, there's hearing now. These are subtle realities which are difficult to understand and it takes a long time to, to even begin to understand intellectually how mindfulness works, let alone develop it. So mindfulness is a life, life's task. What do you see? Uh, you see a woman's head. Um, 
So this woman's head is formed just out of Lego. I think just three colours of Lego and we've got um, a woman's head coming out of here. Of course, there's no woman's head there, just Lego. Actually, there's not even Lego there. It's just a picture for you on a computer screen. But nevertheless, with just a few colours, we've got this idea of um, person there. So exactly what is happening with seeing. Um, if we go to the next slide now, reading, um, we read words, but the words themselves are not on the page. What the page is, is lots of different lines and shades, and our mind translates those lines and shades and colors into words instantaneously without us even knowing about it. So what is seen is real, but the words are not real. They are ideas conditioned by the seeing. So if we go back to our picture, it's the same way. It's exactly the same process. But what is seen is not a picture in this instance. If we go back to the that that picture, our mind reads out these these shapes and and shades to form up the idea of a person. What is seen is real but person is not real. The person is an idea. It's a type of thinking. So thinking of shape and form is thinking. It's not seeing. Now, that happens whenever we go into the movies or the, we watch television. That process is happening. We see and then we think about what we see. The person isn't in the movie. It's not in the picture. We know that, don't we? But the same process is happening whether we see a real person or a person in the movie. A person is the object of thinking read out of what is seen. So what is seen is real, but what is seen is not a person. That thinking follows instantaneously from what is seen. So what is seen is real, but it is not something. Anything read out of that, like table, chair, or iPod, or iPhone, that's thinking uh, with memory as well. There must be the memory of what that object is. So the purpose of mindfulness, the purpose of Buddhism, if you like, is to understand just the nature of reality as it is. What is touched? You know, how many objects can you touch? You might think you can touch a hundred objects. Uh, you can touch the ground, you can touch your leg, your hand, your foot, the table, the chair, the television. Um, but actually, there's only three objects which can be touched. You can touch hardness or softness, you can touch hot or cold, or you can touch motion or pressure. So we are sensitive, the body is sensitive to only those three objects. When you know that you're touching, or you, you have in your mind that you're touching something, it's a combination of touching and thinking. And again, that process is instantaneous. You don't know what is touched and what is thought about. You, the, the process isn't known. You don't know that difference between the seeing and thinking or between the touching and the thinking. It's as if you touch something. But what is touched is just hardness. And the word just there is um, another meaning of the word Anatta. We have, have the word anatta in Buddhism, meaning not self. It's not something, it's just a reality. And this is the purpose, is to understand these natural, ordinary realities of our daily life. Let's take the word heat for a moment. Um, it's a word. It represents a reality which can be experienced through the body sense. So science understands a temperature as the average kinetic energy of the molecules. That's thinking about heat, but heat has a characteristic. Heat has a unique characteristic. Heat is an element, if you like, which can be experienced through the body sense. It's very different from hardness or softness. It's different from a taste. It's different from sound. You cannot make that characteristic from any other reality. So there's a difference between heat and person or between softness and hardness and a person. A person has no characteristic. You cannot touch a person, you touch hardness or softness or heat. You cannot see a person, you see what is seen, call it visible object. Person is an idea, leg is an idea, foot is an idea. Uh, the, the test, if you like, is can you see it on the movie? Go to the movie, can you see 
a person? Yes. Can you see a foot? Yes. Can you see a computer? Yes. Can you see an iPod? Can you see male or female? Yes. All of those things are ideas read out of the visible object. So this difference between concept and reality is is very subtle. It's very deep. You cannot get that in, in a five minute video. Uh, but this the, the Abhidharma is there to help us to understand this difference between concept and reality. Because in order for mindfulness to develop, there has to be the understanding of the object of mindfulness, which is a reality, not your foot or your leg or your hand. So hardness can be the object of mindfulness, but not foot. So if you have the idea of you are sitting, for example, then that indicates the intellectual understanding is wrong because sitting is an idea not a reality it does it's not wrong to think that you're sitting it's just that there must be the clear understanding that a reality is different from a concept thinking is different from seeing so science itself never studies reality directly science has ideas about reality but actually there's this new way of understanding is studying realities directly science can't do that at all not by virtue of the science and to give you an example of why this the mindfulness is a higher way of studying say i was to describe to you trafalgar square in london you know it's got a, a pole in the middle of the statue on the top two lines couple of ponds not a brilliant description and then I say, oh, well, if you get the Northern Line, get out of the Charing Cross, you can go and see it. To see Trafalgar Square is a lot more knowledge than the description of it. And so if we look at understanding, to understand reality directly is a lot higher than conceptually. So science does not study this world of realities. It studies ideas about the world but they never study reality directly but this thing called mindfulness does study reality directly so to recap Abhidharma helps us to understand the object of mindfulness which has to be a reality each moment is conditioned um, when you clap your hand a sound is produced the sound does not come from anywhere it does not go anywhere it arises by a condition and falls away. It only arises once in life. Uh, all realities are like this. They arise by conditions and fall away immediately. They never return again. So anger and sadness, they are realities. They arise by a condition and they fall away immediately. Kindness, compassion, racism, realities which arise and fall away by conditions. There's no abiding self or agent who has control over them. They arise by conditions uh, and then they fall away and they never return. In, in the absolute sense, then, there's no person, no self. They're just different realities arising by conditions and um, falling away. So there's a reality which experiences an object and a reality which does not experience object. And this is life. So the purpose or what mindfulness leads to is detachment from the idea of self. Now, why this is particularly important about this conditioning factor is that mindfulness is conditioned to arise. There's no person who can create it. Um, no, no one can make mindfulness arise. Intention to have mindfulness is not the condition for mindfulness. Sitting isn't the condition for mindfulness. It's the intellectual understanding of realities, of the difference between reality and concept, which is the condition for mindfulness. So mindfulness arises by conditions. You can't have it at will, but you can understand the difference between when it arises performs its function and when it doesn't arise so there must be the firm intellectual understanding of this conditioned nature of realities in order to develop mindfulness otherwise it will be the idea of self trying and we have in this world today secular mindfulness that's non-religious mindfulness and if you have a look at what is their condition for mindfulness it, it boils down to attachment and the idea of self and therefore 
it will fail it cannot work um, so these secular mindfulness is very different from Buddhism um, and Buddhism is very very subtle Buddhism the mindfulness in Buddhism is is it's difficult to understand difficult to develop and the actual right understanding of it will disappear quite soon I would think because it, there's so many misconceptions over it uh, so to sum up, Abhidharma helps us to understand the difference between reality and concept. It helps us to understand uh, conditionality, if you like, the importance of conditionality. According to the commentaries, when the the last book of the Abhidharma disappears, um, the, 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 the teachings will disappear because it's so critical to the development of mindfulness, this, this understanding of conditionality. Now, the other thing that... Um, that Abhidharma gives us, Abhidharma in daily life gives us, is precision. I will just read out uh, from a post. Um, the difficulty is when the basic terms such as Dharma are not clearly understood. What is Dharma now? The answer is not a book Dharma. It is what is real at this very moment. Abhidharma is Dharma. The subtlety of understanding Dharma at this moment. So seeing now is Dharma. What is seen now? The visible object seen is Dharma. But a smartphone is not Dharma. This is because a smartphone is an idea, not a reality. If Dharma, reality, is not understood clearly, then we cannot understand what Nama is. Any Dharma which can experience an object such as seeing or hearing now. Also, without understanding Dharma, we cannot understand what is meant by Rupa, that reality which cannot experience anything such as visible object or sound. So the study of realities, no matter we call it Dharma or Abhidharma or anything else, has to proceed slowly and carefully, considering and understanding the meaning of each term used. It has to be precise. Of course, this is kind of confusing you, isn't it? I mean, this, this is very tricky stuff, and you're not going to get it in 45 minutes. This is just impossible. One of the first utterances of the Buddha was he wasn't sure if anybody could understand it um, he's, and he said oh, this is deep, it's difficult to see it's subtle, it's fine he just wasn't sure there would be anybody around who could understand it, just for a, a few split seconds um, so the study of realities, no matter we call it Dharma or Abhidharma or anything else has to proceed slowly and carefully considering and understanding the meaning of each term it has to be precise why use Pali terms? Uh, Nina Van Gorkum writes, uh, We need the terms because the English translations of the terms are different and not always correct. Many translate Sama Sankapa wrongly as right intention, thereby adding to great confusion as to the development of the Eightfold Path. So in the book, in the book Abhidharma and Daily Life, there are many, many Pali terms, uh, but they automatically help us to understand Damn, this difference between reality and concept because there are no Pali terms there for say face or foot or arm leg or iPod obviously these Pali terms represent either realities or classifications for realities so like kusala means wholesome reality but it does refer to a reality so by getting to know these Pali terms we're getting to know the difference between concept and reality and this is the very condition for mindfulness also if we get to know a core set of terms we're able to access more of the teachings because a lot of the audio available uses some basic terminology and if we understand what is meant by um, that terminology then we can have access to some very very helpful audio um, on Abhidharma and on, on the development of mindfulness and also we can have discussions with our Thai Vietnamese Taiwanese friends the um, and let, let's just take another example metta which means kindness um, now, in our conventional Western language, we, we say, oh, I love my guitar, I love Margot Robbie, I love um, having holidays, I, I am friendly to people. We're using this word love in different ways. Meta is very specific, it's very precise, it's, it's, it's being kind, it's considering the other person or the other, or an animal or the other being, um, and it is rooted in detachment, not attachment. So there's no expectation when there is true love. There's no expectation, no wanting anything back. 
so by using the Pali terms, uh, we can be much more precise with our language. Um, so Abhidharma in Daily Life, the book, it simplifies the complexity of the original text. If you go to the original texts, there are seven books of Abhidharma, four books of commentary, and they are very difficult to read. Um, they translate, the translation lose something as you, you're going from Pali um, to English. It's something is, is lost meanwhile, but they contain everything and it's not suitable or necessary to have a bit of knowledge of all of that. So um, sorry to understand everything that there is. So we, we need to understand the essence of that Dharma, of Abhidharma. Is Abhidharma authentic? There is some dispute about whether Abhidharma was in a, a, a bit added on afterwards. And um, again, I'm going to read from um, something Nita Van Gorkum wrote. Historical reasons may not cure doubts about the authenticity of the scriptures, but careful examination and consideration of the contents of the Buddhist teachings themselves can convince us of their authenticity and their immense value for the development of the way leading to freedom from all suffering. Please see Introduction to the Buddhist Scriptures at the link below. Um, what I've done is to, there's a book coming out, Introduction to the Buddhist Scriptures, around about April 2019. I've just extracted the first um, chapter of that and put it on uh, to the link here. Um, the first chapter is called um, Abhidharma in the Scriptures. Um, there are some reference to um, why it is authentic there, but again history there'll always be those kinds of disputes but the point is that by understanding the essence of dharma you can see how vital it is for understanding the buddhist teachings to understand the suttas because without um, a, a fairly fundamental understanding of the abhidharma you cannot understand the suttas so how to study it so tips as to how to study abhidharma um, it's difficult it's difficult in intellectually and it's a subtle journey it it is necessary to read and consider a lot to have heard a lot to have questioned a lot otherwise we go wrong our defilements make us go wrong um, so we need a lot of patience to develop understanding and it has to be a little bit at a time so that means that we have to be content to learn a little bit at a time um, we may want some quick fix, some 45 minute session where we can meditate at the end of it. Uh, this won't work. Um, this is tricky stuff and you need to take it a little at a time. Again, I would, I'm just going to read something that was written on a post. So it's not a matter of reading the book and studying the details like we would usually do with another subject. The Buddhist teachings are very profound and without such careful considering, there will never be the understanding of dharmas as anatta, not self. As the Buddha said, better to study a few lines carefully and wisely than study all the texts and details with wrong understanding or for the wrong purpose. And there is a quote from the Buddha in the introduction to the Buddhist scriptures. Um, without Abhidharma, it will be difficult to understand the terms in the Sutta commentaries, commentaries use the Abhidharma. So with Abhidharma, we know that it's just Dharma, nothing but Dharma, reality. All experiencing is just Dharma. There is no one, no I, no self at all in the experiencing. There is the experiencing, but no experiencing, no experiencer. So it has to go very, very little, very small amount of um, each day that you just understand it. But there's a wide range of material uh, to read. So we don't have to read this book, Abhidharma in Daily Life, uh, and learn all of the lists or just even uh, get through all of the lists, but we do need to know what is meant by these individual terms in detail. Terms like Dharma, Anatta, Conditionality, Kusala, Akusala. They represent realities of daily life and it is the realities of our daily life which we have to understand. So it's not in the book, but the book is the condition for these realities um, to show up as they are. Okay, so thank you for listening and I hope this is uh, useful for you.